My name is Praveen Nath. I work in digital health strategy at Roche. I want to thank you for joining this Wired Forum and for participating in this discussion today. I was a medical student in the 1990s. I remember the early mornings where one of my jobs was to gather all of the charts before hospital rounds. There were, these were three, the old three ring binders with doctors handwritten notes and orders inside. Only one person could read or write in a chart at a time. And it was the medical student's job to gather all the charts each morning before dawn. We'd search for them at the nurse's station and patient rooms and in conference rooms until we had them all organized in a wheeled rack, which we would push around from room to room during the doctor's rounds. At the end of the day, we had another ritual, which was to make sure the next day's lab tests were ordered for every patient on the service. This meant going from unit to unit in the hospital with a stack of carbon copy lab order forms. Each nursing unit had a rack of addressograph cards for the patients in that unit. These were like little credit cards for each patient with raised lettering, including the name and medical record number. We'd stamp the form for each patient with the addressograph card using machine located in each nursing station so that the name and the record number were imprinted on all three copies. Then we would check boxes next to the tests that we wanted done, tear off one copy to put in the chart, and drop the remaining copies in appropriate bins before the midnight cutoff time. And all through the day, between the morning and the night rituals, we'd conduct a multitude of other similar activities, such as manually transcribing lab results into handwritten notes, shuttling back and forth from the bowels of the hospital to the patient units in order to get x-rays and other records into the hands of people who could act upon them, all the while returning to that addressograph machine to put the patient stamp on all of the paper we were moving around. I was fascinated by the lack of automation in information management and workflows. It seemed astonishing to me that the trainees who had so much knowledge to acquire about the science and practice of medicine were the source of free labor to complete, the, complete these most mundane paper tasks, which even the most basic computing systems of that era could have handled. I decided that I wanted to better understand this problem and to try and solve it. I started working on it during my residency training in emergency medicine. And at the time, we didn't call it digital health. I think most of us called it medical informatics. Eventually, I had jobs at academic medical centers, including as the CIO and chief digital officer of Stanford Healthcare, and at a digital mental health startup, where I worked on this problem with many smart people over the course of about two decades. There were successes and failures over this time. We've solved the problem of searching for paper charts and the stamping of addressograph cards. And we're now confronting new problems with electronic health record usability and digital health adoption. What I'd like to do today is talk a bit about the opportunity and challenges we see with digital health at this point, what we might learn from prior work and how we're thinking about the role of a pharmaceutical company in contributing to the future of digital health. We've all heard the stories about the explosive growth in telehealth. At one of the places I worked, it took us 10 years to get to 4% virtual visits, and two weeks after COVID, the number went to 85%. Health systems, primary care, and behavioral health practices are now reporting increases of 50 to 175 times in telehealth visits. And it's thought that the potential market size for virtual care could reach around 250 billion. But these might not be the most important numbers to notice. 40% of Americans have canceled previously scheduled care as a result of the pandemic. The cost of deferred care for some chronic conditions such as COPD has been estimated increase by seven to 11%. For cancer care, these numbers could be significantly higher. And it's estimated that some 35 million people could develop a new behavioral health condition as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, with early indications suggesting that the prevalence of symptoms is higher in Latinx, Asian, Black, and multiracial groups. This further exacerbates existing health disparities and access problems. I previously worked at MindStrong, a tech-enabled telehealth company focused on serious mental illness. And we knew well that the cost of care for medical conditions increases by thousands of dollars per member per month when a behavioral health condition is also present. This is just for the medical care, not even including the cost of behavioral health treatments. All of this is happening while some forecasts suggest that the impact of COVID-19 may cause up to 10 million Americans to lose their employer-sponsored health care coverage by the end of 2021. 
We watched our health systems nearly collapse as the pandemic unfolded and exposed their fragility and dependence on heroic actions taken by the people on the front lines. We made enormous changes in our lives as we collectively worked to accommodate this fragility, to flatten the curve, and to avoid overloading health systems. And as we instantly transformed how we do our shopping, our work, our school, and our socializing, we placed an unimaginable demand on online retailers, our food supply chain, collaboration platforms such as Google and Zoom, all of which demonstrated remarkable resilience and elasticity. Zoom grew from 10 million daily meeting participants to 300 million with barely a hiccup. Imagine the impact if these systems and platforms lacked the resilience to withstand these changes in demand. Or better yet, imagine if our fragile healthcare system could utilize the same kinds of technologies and operational management systems to build resiliency. So when I think of the digital health opportunity in front of us now, it's to build better healthcare ecosystems with a deeper focus on resilience and sustainability. There's a difference between a digital health tool and an ecosystem. Most digital health tools take the same three-part form. First, a wearable device or a mobile app that captures patient data. Second, algorithms, including artificial intelligence, to generate insight from the data. And third, a portal for the healthcare provider to visualize the insight at the point of care. There are problems with each part of this tool model. First, the wearable app the wearable device or the app usually requires that the patient has to do some work, either to use the app to take a test or to record symptoms or to accommodate wearing a sensor on their body. For people with a chronic disease, unless the app uh, is solving a meaningful problem, it isn't helping. It can instead become an annoying reminder of the disease itself. Second, the insight generation the algorithm has to be validated, approved by regulators, and adopted into practice. This process usually begins with what are called adjunctive claims. Adjunctive, that means that the digital measurements and the insights are adjunct or complementary to existing methods of care rather than a substitute for them. And healthcare providers are largely left to figure out for themselves how to bring this into their practices. It can mean more work instead of less to use an adjunctive in addition to the traditional standard of care. It can take years to turn even a validated measurement system into an accepted practice with a non-adjunctive claim. And lastly, there are problems with the portal as the user interface. It's common to believe that digital health tools will deliver insights and value to doctors through a portal. Some people think their portal will become a platform. But how many portals and platforms can a doctor use? Doctors want no part of this complexity. They live and die by the electronic health record. They hate it, but it's not going away anytime soon, nor is it reasonable to imagine that a technical innovation is gonna solve many of the problems associated with the electronic health record. This is because the electronic health record problems are centered around the nature of the work, the culture of autonomy and accountability, the incentives and the payment models, all of which are topics for another talk. So what about integrating the new digital insights into the electronic health record. That's a, that's a better solution. But how much time do doctors have to look at and digest more information in the current practice model? Zero. They're already burned out. And the hospital IT departments, like the one I used to manage, don't have budgets to staff multiple integration projects. These are the problems with the digital health tool model. So what's an ecosystem model and how can it address these problems? An ecosystem model is not about deploying digital tools into existing practices. It's about redesigning the practice from first principles with the digital tools embedded. It's about creating an adaptable learning model for the work that people do and the roles they play. Healthcare providers have typically had a big say in how they organize their work, including how they sequence and delegate tasks, when and how to trust others with critical components, and when and whether to adhere to protocols. But everyone is unsatisfied with the models that have evolved. A better design system builds standardization, modularization, and accountability into the teams. It allows professionals to focus on the tasks where their training and their experience are most necessary. It addresses some of the barriers to trust, delegation, and standardization, but it also 
takes away some autonomy in both the design and the execution of the work. And this is what makes it so controversial. In this case, the problem is too complicated to take on at the macro ecosystem level. To reduce the complexity, the scope can be limited to a specific disease area. We're seeing this in the development of tech-enabled diabetes management services, for example, such as Livongo, Omada, and MySugar. Here, teams of healthcare providers, including physicians, pharmacists, nurses, coaches, and care managers, are organized to work in a digitally powered virtual model to achieve better outcomes for the members of these services. Let's take a look at how these kinds of micro ecosystem models address some of the problems with the digital tools in the traditional model. First, we mentioned the problem of the app or sensor, which can be unhelpful or annoying to patients. Ecosystem solutions use the app for more than just data collection. The app becomes the conduit for value added services that aren't available in the conventional model of care. These could be 24 seven telehealth access to reach a virtual healthcare team, a place to receive nutrition coaching, a way to discuss medications and to get adjustments in dosing, and a place to have mental health care and social needs addressed. These services are often difficult to obtain, and their inclusion in the micro ecosystem approach gives the patient immediate and sustained value, keeping them engaged with the app. And sustained engagement helps the app to continue to collect the necessary data to help the machine learning models improve. Second, we mentioned the problem of the early stage adjunctive claim. This is the problem that occurs when brand new measurement and insights are complementary to the existing models of care and the methods for adoption of the insight into the practice are still being developed. The micro ecosystem approach builds a team of healthcare providers who are selected for their comfort with the adoption of complementary measures and insights into a new practice model. Often these are recent graduates or those with design or operations background from outside of healthcare. They're simultaneously contributing to the validation of the tool while they uncover the implications of embedding it into new and potentially disruptive ways of working. And lastly, we mentioned the problem of the portal as a user interface for healthcare providers. Because the micro ecosystem approach is framed as a service rather than a portal, it can assume the identity of a referring physician colleague rather than a digital portal for the existing healthcare team caring for a patient. Physicians are very comfortable referring patients to colleagues from other specialties, reading reports of the care they provide, discussing patients in case conferences and other venues. The tech-enabled service model can replace the burdensome technical portal with the more humanistic user interface of a consulting service. This doesn't obviate the use of technology in sharing insights and summaries of care and visualizations of data, but it allows it to be packaged in a more comfortable, familiar, helpful, and humanized manner. High touch service models like the ones I'm describing are generally effective in improving outcomes, but they're expensive to launch and support at scale. However, when they're powered by digital tools, there's a flywheel effect. The services create immediate value for the patient, which drives adoption and sustained engagement with the technology turning the flywheel. And adoption provides the scale for building more efficiency in the service delivery, including eventually automating certain elements of the services. It also provides the data to improve the algorithms, which allow for early identification of risk and the opportunity to intervene at the individual and the population level. Meanwhile, the clinical team is also evolving and standardizing its own work within the micro ecosystem, which allows for greater efficiency and eventual automation of that work. This can lower the skill requirements for certain tasks. It can drive down costs and allow for more users to be served, further turning the flywheel. So the result is a model which can serve larger populations over more dispersed geographies. It has greater standardization and automation, which allow for more sustainability with regard to cost and greater elasticity and resilience in response to changes in demand. At Roche, we wanna help build these tech enabled micro ecosystems. We think of our strengths in three areas. First, we've invested in the collection and analysis of complex and messy clinical grade data. It's the essence of what we do in the entire drug development process, from the early stage biology to clinical trials to ongoing evidence generation. We're experts in understanding what does and doesn't work in the clinical care of individuals and populations, and we can bring this rigor to the development and evaluation of digital health tools. 
The second is that we specialize in complex diseases where the impact of treatment is high, but access can be limited. We want these treatments to reach more people at lower cost. In addition to our knowledge of these diseases and how to treat them, we know quite a lot about how to detect the disease itself and measure its progression through digital biomarkers and other technologies. And last, we have the resources of Flatiron Foundation Medicine and Roche Diagnostics, which cover a spectrum of real world data in oncology care, molecular genomic testing, and a broad set of diagnostic and clinical decision support solutions. Our approach is collaborative and holistic across the larger healthcare ecosystem. We also have challenges. The biggest risk is the misconception that if something is clinically validated, which is what we're good at, that that's enough for a launch. If we build it, they will come. This is how it works when we produce effective drug therapies, but it's not true in digital. We have to understand what creates meaningful experience and value every day for people who use these solutions. We also have to understand that this, va this value across diverse racial, cultural, and socioeconomic groups so that we can use these innovations to reduce rather than contribute to the problems of access. This means delivering micro ecosystem tech enabled services that change the structure and function of the workplace. We won't do it by ourselves. We need to find the right partnerships with tech companies and innovative provider and payer organizations where we each bring our respective strengths to the table. The most interesting solutions can blur the lines that delineate our typical customers and competitors. Big tech firms and other new entrants are not operating within the traditional boundaries of who is a payer, provider, and pharma company. Apple, Amazon, and Google Alphabet are now in healthcare delivery, health insurance, and pharmacy businesses. These companies are designing new solutions from first principles, which means that the role of traditional incumbent players doesn't matter so much anymore. We've made big steps since the days of the paper chart and the addressograph machine, and yet anyone who participates in the current health system knows that we have a long way to go. At Roche, we're taking some of our first big steps toward tech-enabled microecosystems in disease areas, such as ophthalmology, where we're leveraging our knowledge of complex eye diseases, our ability to make digital measurements of vision, and our novel therapies, including the implantable port delivery system, to build new solutions that help patients manage their condition and their treatment. We're proud of partnerships such as that with Dr. Pierce Keene at Moorfields Eye Hospital in the UK, from whom you'll be hearing later in this conference. And despite the challenges we've discussed, the opportunity ahead is enormous, and we're looking for new partners to help us continue to innovate and disrupt. Thank you for joining today, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.